You could tell when people were switching from, I felt this in prayer, to this is my opinion and I came in with this and I want to make sure that this is heard. The challenges, concerns, and success stories from the first phase of the Synod on Synodality in the U.S. and Europe as bishops begin analyzing the feedback from the faithful. The overturning of Roe v. Wade gives hope to pro-lifers especially and to everyone that however long it takes, there is hope. Abortion laws in the U.S. reverberate for pro-lifers around the world. We continue our examination of global abortion policies with a look at what's happening in Asia. Mary, uh, as you can see, has had leprosy. Uh, they had to cut her hands off. Uh, she's got four children. Suffering from an ancient disease that ravages the body and banishes victims to the margins of society. How biblical stories of leprosy provide hope for those afflicted. Music, art, and 3D technology bring together the life of St. Peter in an innovative way. EWTN News In-Depth starts now. I would like that the Synod will be hijacked by one, <laughs> by the Holy Spirit. Asking the Holy Spirit to intervene in the Synod on Synodality as concerns are raised that the first phase was found wanting. The Synod on Synodality is a global Vatican initiative to listen and dialogue with the members of the Body of Christ so the Church can become more effective in sharing the Gospel by becoming a Church of closeness, compassion and tender love. The historic event began last year with outreach to leadership in dioceses around the world to gather information. It's a massive undertaking with input requested from every parish around the world. The Synod on Synodality has four phases. The first, the diocesan phase, wrapped up at the end of the summer and was the local consultation process meant to engage with all people at the parish level through Vatican-provided templates and methods. In August, church leaders concluded the second phase, involving the Episcopal conferences and religious orders, which produced diocesan reports on the listening sessions, a regional summary of the local consultations. And we're now in the continental phase, which will go on until March, and will finalize the reports from around the world and engage five continental assembl assemblies from January to March. And finally, the universal phase, when the Synod of Bishops will be held in Rome next October. Incoming reports from the church-wide listening note that many people in the church in Europe feel that in the first phase of this multi-year event, their voices fell on deaf ears. There are also concerns that the changes some suggest contradict church teaching. Layered on top of the Synod on Synodality is the German Synodal Path, a separate meeting process in Germany pursuing controversial changes to church teaching. EWTN Rome Bureau Chief Andreas Tonhauser explains. A historic consultation, an unprecedented event in the history of the Church. We then ask... Cardinal Jean-Claude Hollerich found strong words presenting the first results from the global synodal process. The Archbishop of Luxembourg and head of the European Bishops' Conference is also the related general of the Global Synod. He's responsible for collecting the various national contributions in order to combine them to a continental working document. Ultimately, he will define and present the results of the Synod to the Pope. For the continental phase, in which we are in right now, the feedback of the faithful is analyzed and grouped in various topics for the bishops to discuss when they meet next year in Rome. Pope Francis is the driving force behind this process. In his address for the opening of the Synod last October, the pontiff urged the faithful to participate in this process and insisted that the Church needs to listen. He said that there was no need for creating another Church, but a different Church. To him, this different Church does not stand aloof from life, but bandages wounds and heals broken hearts. Cardinal Mario Grech, the Secretary General of the Synod, confirmed this message saying, I would like that the Synod will be hijacked by one, <laughs> by the Holy Spirit. 
This statement came as a response to questions from journalists if there wasn't a certain danger that the synod would be used to pressure through ideologically motivated changes in the church. The National Catholic Register's European correspondent, Solène Tadier, reported that open letters gathering hundreds of signatures of young people were released in Belgium, Ireland and Portugal. The national synthesis of these three countries stood out. They are calling for the ordination of women to the priesthood, optional celibacy, or a change of doctrine regarding homosexual and transgender people. After the, our diocesan uh, reports, we had this national level of uh, like the Conference of Bishops of Portugal, um, had also a, 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 a reports that they did themselves. And uh, well, many people were not very happy about that, about that report. Uh, for some language it used that didn't feel very, let's say, uh, e ecclesial. People mostly uh, were happy. The time between the documents were published in Rome and that we had to start the process was very short because we had no ever had a synod here and we had no experience, so we would have needed, I think, six months or more to prepare it. Cardinals Dreck and Hollerick made clear during the presentation of the first consulting phase that there is no predefined outcome of the Synod and no agenda other than listening to the faithful. Cardinal Hollerick himself used the opportunity to clarify his stance on one of the controversial issues brought forth by the German Synodal Path. He said that he would indeed support the Church's current stance towards homosexuality distancing himself from his earlier statement this year when he had indicated that the church's teaching on this issue is false. This raised concerns about a certain bias that the cardinal could bring to the synodal process. The German synodal path has been progressing longer than the global synod. It is a separate process started by church leaders and lay employees of the church in Germany. They are calling for radical changes, including hot-button issues on the Church's view on sexuality, same-sex marriage, ordination of women to the priesthood, and its teaching on contraceptives. Many German Catholics are perplexed at the German Synodal Path, as they say it does not represent them at all. The same critique has now been voiced against the Synod of Synodality in Germany. Birgit Keller, from a Catholic initiative of laypersons called Neuer Anfang, which stands for New Beginning, shares her perception. The synodal process does not represent the German faithful at all. Personally, I have never been invited in my parish or anywhere to participate. All my friends across Germany had similar experiences. We ask ourselves who they actually interviewed or let participate in this global synodal process. We are all concerned that the documents, the results from the German synodal path, will inform the global process. This is not what German faithful think. I thought that the intention of the Pope was to listen to the faithful. I do not have the feeling this has happened. So far, 112 reports from Episcopal conferences have been received and reviewed. An expert group of more than 50 cardinals, religious and lay people, convened outside of Rome to prepare the working paper for the next period of the Synod, the Continental Phase. The paper will be published in the coming weeks and provide the topics to be further discussed. Colonel Gregg showed a lot of enthusiasm after the meeting. Speaking about the feedback from the faithful across the world, he felt optimistic that the Church offers itself as a home for all, because the experience of synodality that we're all living leads us to widen the space of the tent, to truly welcome everyone. In Rome, Andreas Townhauser, EWTN News in depth. In the United States, after the diocesan phase was completed, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops reflected in their National Synthesis Report that the first phase was met with excitement, confusion, and skepticism. The Church of the United States is made up of an estimated 66.8 million Catholics across 178 Latin archdioceses and 18 Eastern Catholic eparchies. The USCCB says an estimated 700,000 people participated, that there were more than 30,000 opportunities to share and engage, and that some 22,000 reports were generated in the first phase of the process. 
one archdiocese in the United States is being looked at as a model for success for their work in the diocesan phase of the Global Synod. EWTN reporter Mark Irons spoke with synod leaders and laity in the Archdiocese of Denver to get a better idea of what influenced their process and contributed to their outcome. The church isn't a democracy. The church was founded by Jesus and led by the Holy Spirit. The laity participated and the spirit guided the Archdiocese of Denver. Encouraging the worldwide church to more effectively live out its mission, Pope Francis opened the Synod on Synodality in 2021 with these words. The Synod then offers us the opportunity to become a listening church, to listen to the Spirit in adoration and prayer. It was, what did you hear in prayer? What is the Holy Spirit saying for the Church of Northern Colorado? That question was given to the laity earlier this year in the Archdiocese of Denver. Susie Maurer, a parishioner at the Shrine of St. Anne and a synod representative for the Archdiocese, led listening sessions at her church. Time for prayer was built into the sessions, and during the discussion, the focus was not on the opinions of the participants, but what they had heard in prayer with the Holy Spirit's guidance. Why is that, that way of going about it important for this process, as opposed to just letting people come in and share anything yeah. they wanted? And so if the Holy Spirit's the one leading the church, and each of us is baptized and is confirmed we've received the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit can also speak and work through us. There's just a new like power, a new dimension, as well as a, a faithfulness in that that just doesn't exist in just asking for people's opinions. The Archdiocese covering Northern Colorado seemed to follow the guidance of Pope Francis, who said, the Synod is not a parliament or an opinion poll. The Synod is an ecclesial event and its protagonist is the Holy Spirit. If the spirit is not present, there will be no synod. And in Denver, this point was made clear. What the church has magisterially taught is not up for grabs. The archdiocese did not provide a forum to debate church teaching. Elias Moe, a member of the synod team and the superintendent of Catholic schools, says almost 90 parishes submitted listening session reports to the archdiocese. And then more prayer and discernment followed as the content was evaluated. In the Lord, okay, Lord, let us move past our own personal preferences and agendas and, you know, uh, ideas of what should be or what shouldn't be. And, you know, what are you saying? The final synod report from the Archdiocese reads, the Holy Spirit made it abundantly clear that our first mission is to divine intimacy with the Trinity. That relationship can flourish in northern Colorado. Besides offering daily mass, many of the churches in the archdiocese have Eucharistic adoration chapels, providing spaces to spend intimate time with Jesus. Don't worry about this, don't worry about that. Worry about this right now, which is abiding, finding unity in the Eucharist. A number of faith-based organizations called Denver Home, from the Augustine Institute to the Fellowship of Catholic University Students to Christ in the City. In northern Colorado, Catholics may be motivated by mission work, but Andrew McGowan, the executive director of evangelization for the Archdiocese, described a synod process that made clear the continuing mission of the church must be motivated first by a relationship. Helping our people to hear the invitation from the Holy Spirit to come back and really abide in prayer, abide in the sacraments in the Lord. Uh, and if we can begin to do that, then all the other pieces of the synod are going to come into play. Like, that's really step one the Lord's told us to do. During the synod process, the Archdiocese of Denver was very intentional. And the work of the church here continues to draw inspiration from an event that took place in a park outside the city almost 30 years ago. Faith in this archdiocese was boosted by what happened in this empty field. Over half a million people gathered for World Youth Day, led by Pope John Paul II. In 1993, people from all over the world came to Denver. The Pope sent them home with inspiring words that live on today. The church asks you to go, to go in the power of the Holy Spirit, to go to those who are near and those who are far away, share with them the freedom you have found in Christ. The message to evangelize echoed throughout the synod process in Denver and areas of particular need were identified. It became very clear that there was so much need to define and strengthen the mission of the family. Sister Faustina Deppi was a synod representative. She is principal at Saints Peter and Paul Catholic STEM School outside Denver. 
In the final Archdiocesan Synod report, it states, Parents are the primary formators and educators of their children, but many are lost and confused as to how to carry out this role. Sister Faustina says her school will continue to support students and parents as they learn to live the faith. And I would say that's probably the heart of, of the service that we offer as schools, is not just strengthening the individual child, but being able to build up families. In schools, churches, and cities around the world, this Catholic Church Synod will only be fruitful if listening to the Holy Spirit is followed by action. So much will depend on our own uh, fortitude, really, to kind of persevere and, and go where he told us to go. Mark Irons, EWTN News In Depth. A new EWTN Real Clear Opinion research poll reflects declining numbers in church attendance in the U.S. We explore those results and speak with the director of university ministry in Boston, Father Eric Caden, to learn what he's hearing from younger Catholics. That's next after the break. Plus, we are ready to listen and we are ready to help in any way. Pregnancy support in Asia for those who might otherwise seek an abortion. On a continent with diverse attitudes about the pro-life movement, we'll take a look at what's being done to change minds and hearts in building a culture of life. That report coming up. Welcome back to EWTN News In-Depth. A concern for all religions, keeping the faithful in the pews. Some new numbers from the latest EWTN Real Clear Opinion poll that surveyed more than 1,500 Catholics in September and was released this week gives us a better understanding of mass attendance and what Americans accept and believe from church teaching. Just 24% of Americans say they attend Mass once a week. 14% never attend. A startling 40% say they do not believe in the real presence of the Eucharist, with just 50% who do believe and 9% that are unsure. And for the Sacrament of Confession, the numbers are also grim, with 50% of people saying they never go to confession and just 3% who go at least once a month. We're joined now by Father Eric Caden, Director of University Ministry and Vocations for the Archdiocese of Boston. Father Caden, it's so great to have you with us. Why do you think the number of Catholics returning to Mass are so dismal? I think it's a, it's a challenge we have always in every generation to continually return to the understanding that our faith ultimately is this extraordinary and awesome relationship individually and collectively with our God who desires and loves you and me. And, you know, in that challenge is in the midst of a culture and a time with all sorts of distractions and, and occupations throughout our day to remember that we are made, we're created in love to be lovers of God and of each other, and, and that our faith and the Mass is that perfect place and time of encounter and entering into that great mystery of God's love and salvation and redemption of me and of you, so that we can continually be restored and transformed. And, you know, it's something that Again, amid the distractions of our lives, we have to be continually reminded of and returning to. And so it's always a challenge. Are you seeing a difference in the response to that call and that proposal on college campuses post-COVID? Um, I think so. I think the all young people, all people in general, we're made for a relationship and for a community. And so COVID created a, an extraordinary disconnect uh, between and among peoples. It quite literally isolated us so frequently and for such an extended period of time that we're starved for relationship and community. So if anything, this is an extraordinary opportunity to remind people of that ultimate and awesome relationship that we have with God. And, and young people, for the most part, or, or all people, respond to this. And so for having such a long period of time without, in the most natural way, contact with the one who loves us perfectly, 
not just abstractly or spiritually, but tangibly, really, and sacramentally, you know, it slowly affects how we understand that relationship with God. The EWTN poll shows that 30% of Americans that identify as Catholic don't accept key teachings of the church, and 17% say that their Catholic upbringing had only a very minor influence on their life. Our bureau chief here in D.C., Dr. Matthew Bunsen, shared his take on this. Let's take a listen. The influence of secular culture, of relativism, uh, the rise, so to speak, of uh, what have traditionally been called cafeteria Catholics, those Catholics uh, who think that they get to pick and choose which of the teachings of the church they want to follow. It's a disconnect, a fundamental disconnect, I, I fear, uh, that uh, has really impacted so many Catholics uh, of several generations, as I was saying, and the situation seems to be getting worse with each passing generation. Father Caden, do you agree with that? And also, do you think that there's a role that the church has failed in properly forming and catechizing Catholics? Yes, I think, of course, there's been failures with respect to catechesis and understanding of the faith. But again, I just return always to this deeper level of, of relationship and encounter with Jesus who, because all of our teaching, which is wonderful and more than coherent, it's life-giving, yes. it's transformative, is always in the context of this love affair of God with us and us with him. And, you know, and so the more we as priests, I would offer, especially diocesan priests, parish priests, can, can help our people through our own relationship with Jesus by talking about it, by modeling as a father does to his children, what this intimacy, what this love looks like. You know, there are practical things we can do to help people recognize this relationship, like physically, you know, when possible, leaving our churches open. Mm -hmm. You know, the parish I live at had, um, we don't have air conditioning, so in the summer this is easy to do. The pastor years ago just would leave the door physically open from 7 in the morning until 9 o'clock at night. And it's extraordinary. People would be driving by this 150-year-old church every day, and when they saw the door open, they would halt in their car, pull over, and walk in. They said, I've driven by this for 10 years. I never knew what was inside. And these would be Catholics sometimes, unfortunately. <laughs> and, they would, and they would discover the beauty of our faith. They would see these extraordinary stations of the cross, this beautiful old church, which is just extraordinary, and they would start to pray. And the priests were always available and they were around. And suddenly these people are going to confession. They're being transformed. Because guess what? Jesus does all the work because it's a relationship. You know, we see this in college campuses. When Catholic centers are open and available, you know, students want, are so hungry. And again, God's doing all the work. That's right. The Holy Spirit is moving in every person right now, encouraging and inspiring them to meet him. And so we need to do everything possible to remove these very easy and obvious physical obstacles to help people come to Jesus. I have a fun question for you about relationship. You were talking about the importance of the incarnational relationship. A surprising 76% of people EWTN polled said they believe in guardian angels. Is that a launching point to help people pray more and hopefully come back to Mass or be more open the way you were describing? Absolutely. I mean, there are opportunities everywhere. You know, that poll helps us to recognize that people notice that there's a spiritual reality. Mm. I mean, they notice it in the beauty of nature. That's why people pause at sunsets and they're in awe at great mountains and the ocean. And when they talk about spiritual realities and truths like guardian angels, it's they want to know more. They hunger. There has to be more to my life than merely material gains, than this endless struggle, which on its own never, ever, ever satisfies. There has to be more. And guess what? There is. And as we help them from that springboard come to understand the fullness of our faith, they eat it up. Of course they do. Thank you so much, Father Eric, for making time for us today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Coming up, abortion policy in Asia. We continue our global look at the effort to save the unborn. I wanted to reach the really people who are, were in the worst position possible. 
reaching out to those in the margins of society in one of the poorest countries in the world, the work being done to help those suffering with leprosy. Plus, the latest on efforts to help the victims of Hurricane Ian in Florida, ahead on EWTN News In Depth. The rich diversity of culture in Asia brings with it a diverse tapestry of religions. This vast region hosts numerous religious traditions, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. It's no surprise that each one of these communities and those who identify with neither hold varying attitudes toward abortion. EWTN News In Depth continues our look at abortion policies around the globe with our focus this week on Asia. Here's reporter Rizal Rages. <laughs> The Philippines, home to the largest Catholic population in Asia. According to Catholic Directory of the Philippines, as of 2021, there were about 85 million Catholics living in the country. And because Catholicism is deeply rooted in the country, the Philippines is a stronghold of pro-life beliefs. Abortion is a taboo, a crime and a sin, and has been illegal in the country for more than a century. Under current law, women found to have had an abortion and anyone who assists in the procedure face prison terms of up to six years. Despite the country's restrictive law, an estimated 1.1 million abortions occur every year, according to a University of the Philippines study in 2020. Guttmacher Institute states that many who seek abortion undergo unsafe procedures, with 1,000 women dying each year from abortion complications. Pregnancy Support Services of Asia, an affiliate of Heartbeat International, hopes to shatter these numbers. Since we started in 2004, um, we have um, at least helped not only women, but men and women, our couples. We have helped uh, 48,000 in the different areas of um, services. You know? And then um, at least every year we have 10 babies saved from abortion. PSSA establishes and supports pregnancy help centers across Asia through prevention, crisis intervention and healing. If you want to help other people, if you want people to be pro-life, then start with us. Let us give life to every woman who is pregnant and in need. PSSA, along with other pro-life organizations like the Missionary Families of Christ, defend the church's teachings while helping women choose life. The Missionary Families of Christ is a Catholic missionary community in Asia whose primary goal is to strengthen families and bring them closer to Jesus. As a Catholic, uh, as a Christian, and as a Filipino, we need uh, to come together church leaders and lay people to advocate uh, pro-life laws in the Congress and have a widespread uh, pro-life teaching in schools, parishes, to create a culture of life among Filipinos. Armenia joins several other countries and territories in Asia that allow abortion without restriction, including Cambodia, China, North Korea, Singapore, and Vietnam. For the region's two most populous nations, China and India, abortion is a part of population control and widespread poverty. China was the first large developing country to enact a liberal abortion law in 1957 and even promoted the practice under its strict decades-long one-child policy. In 2016, China raised this cap to a two-child policy and then further increased the limit to three children in 2021 to encourage population growth. They're trying to uh, reduce the number of, of, of abortions. But as I mentioned, there are uh, almost as many abortions done in China today as there are live births, because that has, over the last 40 years of the one-child policy, become almost part of the, the culture of China. Abortion has been ingrained into the Chinese people. Steve Mosier is the president of the Population Research Institute, a nonprofit research group that promotes pro-natal and pro-family laws and policies worldwide. Mosher believes that China's one-child policy had detrimental effects on the country's economy and overall population. There is another dark history of abortions seen in both China and India. The problem in both India and China has been the killing of little girls, both before and after birth, a female infanticide 
and sex-selective abortion have been rampant in, in both countries for a long time because both countries have a strong cultural preference for sons. Sex-selective abortions are now illegal in both China and India, but its ramifications are still felt today. In 1971, India legalized abortion for women under certain conditions, such as the pregnancy being a danger to life or when pregnancy is a result of rape. Just earlier this week, India's Supreme Court legalized abortion up to 24 weeks. Before the top court's ruling, only married women were allowed to have an abortion up to the 24th week, while unmarried women were limited to 20 weeks. Dr. Ligaya Acosta is the Asia Oceana Regional Director of Human Life International. Although women have more access to abortion in Asia, the pro-life movement she's been witnessing has never been stronger. So with the overturning of uh, Roe v. Wade with the Dodd's decision, of course, um, it has a great impact on us. In fact, after that happened, India, where there is rampant abortion, they conducted for the very first time the March for Life. Dr. Acosta travels throughout Asia, conducting pro-life training programs and hosting local and international conferences. I am hopeful, judging from, from the way that we are received in the many countries and, um, and the very touching reactions of our participants, that there's a lot of hope. Lorena is also looking forward to what the future holds and puts the faith in the hands of the younger generation. We know that uh, the young people, they are the future of this country. They are the future of the church. They are the future of our faith. That's why we need to bring them along and help them understand. Rosal Regis, EWTN News in Depth. As we've seen in Rizal's report, there are varying degrees of abortion laws across the very culturally, religiously, and politically diverse landscape of Asia. Dr. Jamai Gatula, lecturer on international law at the University of Asia and the Pacific School of Law, joins us from the Philippines now to dig a little deeper into the pro-life challenges there and in India and China. It's so great to have you here with us. We just heard that illegal abortions are quite common in the Philippines. Is the government doing anything to support pregnant women? Well, first of all, we don't really know how common it is in the Philippines, um, precisely because it is indeed a criminal act. We don't really have the exact numbers. Mm. A lot of the numbers that you have there are um, pretty much suppositions. So assuming that the numbers are indeed uh, correct, let us um, say that there are indeed a lot of efforts being made by the government to help um, pregnant women, especially, of course, uh, single pregnant women. A lot of it has to do with uh, development of income, being able, uh, being able to go back to being educated, uh, tax breaks, uh, vacation breaks, um, again, uh, mental and psychological assistance that could be given to them by the government. Um, there has been recently passed a single mother uh, a law of uh, giving welfare benefits for single mothers um, but I have to say that a lot of it is essentially um, treating the symptom rather than the disease or perhaps band-aid solutions. Um, the, the fact that there is indeed an increase in, in teenage pregnancies in the Philippines is what should be addressed rather than the pregnancies itself. Um, perhaps greater uh, adherence or, or knowledge with regard to, to um, the responsibility needed for, for pregnancy. Um, the the uh, advocacy for for more responsible um, parenthood or even for for family planning in a, in a more responsible way should perhaps be the ones that's emphasized. As it is, uh, the focus I think of the government is is uh, a, a bit misplaced. Um, there are indeed um, moves right now to decriminalize abortion, but again, that's I think more of a uh, panacea rather than actually helping the 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 or addressing the true problem which is the rising uh, teenage pregnancies or rising incidences of, of broken families or single motherhoods in the Philippines, which uh, ultimately will redound to um, not uh, to the advantage or benefit of the children that will eventually result from these pregnancies. Are there consequences, moving over into China, are there consequences for pro-life advocacy in China, either social or legal consequences? Well, interestingly enough, if you're in China, perhaps there may be some sort of um, wind into your sails, so to speak, because of the two things, because of the recent ruling in, in, in the U.S., which has given those who are more constitutionally minded some legal ground 
to be able to go against uh, abortion. But I think the, the main reason why I think uh, the pro-life movement should be getting a little bit of a bump is the fact that there, there are really great concerns right now with regard to their population. Um, right now, there are estimates that perhaps uh, China's population will greatly decrease to around the 750 million to even below 600 million, but even middle of the century. Uh, assume, this is under the assumption, for example, that uh, China is overestimating its population um, um, count. Mm -hmm. uh, India, for example, will probably be overtaking China by middle of the century, even Nigeria so, uh, is, is expected to do so. And, uh, and, and the fact that they, you have a rapidly aging Chinese population perhaps is one of the reasons why China is, loosen, is tightening a little its, its uh, abortion laws and loosening its population control uh, programs, particularly the one-child policy that it recently did, in, I think, in 2016. Right. Those changes were significant. You mentioned the effect of Roe versus Wade. India's abortion laws were enacted around the same time as Roe versus Wade, that decision that created a right to abortion in the United States. Do you think we could someday see a similar change in India? Well, that's really difficult because India is in the opposite position. Um, I mean, India is, is in a way um, increasing its population in, in such a way that it will actually even overtake China. So perhaps... Uh, Population-wise, uh, it may be, even though it may not be the correct thing to, to think of, um, the Malthusian mindset may perhaps be coming in as far as a lot of the Indian policymakers are concerned. And so there, there may be some impetus for them to actually uh, agree to, to uh, a more uh, loosening up of their abortion laws, which we have seen in their Supreme Court, which is actually an agreement to have... Uh, abortion for 24 weeks uh, up to the 24 weeks of gestation period which is even far more uh, strict than the one that was uh, actually the subject of the Dobbs uh, ruling so um, it's 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 really well it, it's really hard to to be able to determine what would be the ultimate outcome as far as India's population um, policies will be concerned. They recently had a law loosening up or even re giving recognition of rights as far as like as far as sex workers is concerned. So that perhaps gives you some sort of, uh, of an idea of where the progressive mindset of, of, of a lot of India's policymakers are, uh, as, at least as of now. It seems like it's a big contradiction to allow sex workers and then at the same time be worried about population control. If that re is that really the motivation that they're changing from 20 weeks to 24 weeks from a desire to control the population? Um, well, the, the desire that, that's actually put uh, uh, in, 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 in officially is the fact is the fact that there could be no distinction being made between married women and unmarried women, uh, and that would be probably correct in in the sense that uh, if you're going to be allowing unmarried uh, married women to have uh, abortion up to 24 weeks, then indeed there should be no reason why you should limit it to married women and not give it to unmarried women. But ultimately, why the question is why you should even be allowing abortion for for women at all, uh, even up to the point of, of having it uh, to the 24th week of gestation. Um, and, and the only reason that we can come up with, including the fact that uh, India, for example, would be quite uh, enthusiastic with regard to contraception or, or, or other reproductive, um, so-called reproductive health plans, um, could probably, could only perhaps give an indication as, as that population control is their, is their main um, reason for this. Um, and, and the fact that they are also limiting, for example, sex selectivity. Uh, is, is, is also one of the reasons, I think, why we could probably point to population control as the mindset or the purpose for, for these uh, abortion policies. Thank you so much, Dr. Jemai. Thank you. Pope Francis appeals to Putin for an immediate ceasefire in Ukraine. That and other top headlines in the Week in Review. When we return, stay with us. The graphics, the great work they, they've done, it's, it's incredible. And later, 3D technology brings our first Pope to life. We'll tell you about the incredible movie event happening every night at St. Peter's Basilica. News about Ukrainian forces recapturing territory tops the week in review. Ukraine's counteroffensive in occupied regions is undermining Russia's attempt to control areas that President Vladimir Putin claims to have annexed.
Putin based his claim on four regions seen here by alleging that those living there expressed their desire to become part of Russia through a vote, a vote the United Nations called illegal. Russia's army does not have full control of those areas, allowing Ukrainian forces to make steady and significant gains in taking them back. Ukraine's defense minister tweeted a map of his forces claimed offensive so far. As the war enters its seventh month, U.S. officials say they will be giving Ukraine an additional $625 million in security assistance. But the battle is far from over, now with looming nuclear threats from Russian President Vladimir Putin. Putin warns that any attack on Russian soil may be met with a nuclear response. That humanity again finds itself before the threat of atomic war is absurd. What more has to happen? How much more blood has to flow for us to understand that war is never a solution? In a departure from his weekly Angelus reflection on the Gospel reading on Sunday, Pope Francis dedicated five minutes to sharing his concern on the risks of nuclear escalation and the catastrophic consequences it could have worldwide. In a rare move, Francis appealed directly to Russian President Vladimir Putin by his title, for a ceasefire. He also appealed to Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky to be open to serious proposals for peace. <laughs> Protests sparked by the death of a 22-year-old woman in Iran have entered their third week. Masa Amini died while in custody of the so-called morality police, known to arrest people who do not follow a proper conservative dress code. Reports vary on whether Amini violated religious norms by how she wore her hijab or her style of pants. Women and schoolgirls throughout the country have torn and burned their hijabs or cut their hair in an act of defiance. Protests in the streets have been met with force from Iran's paramilitary. Thousands have been arrested and hundreds injured. On Thursday, the U.S. imposed more sanctions on Iranian government officials in response to Amini's death. Now, questions are being raised on the U.S. striking a nuclear deal with the regime. Residents in Florida are returning to their homes after escaping Hurricane Ian, the deadliest storm to hit the state in almost a century. Hurricane Ian has officially claimed the lives of 89 people, but that number could still climb. Search and rescue teams continue to scour neighborhoods to help those trapped in homes and cars. Aid is pouring into the state to provide basic needs like food and first aid. Recovering from the effects of this catastrophic storm could take years. Relief efforts like this, when you have a major disaster, take a very, very long time. Just because they come off the media screen, doesn't mean that the relief efforts stop. And it's it's a lot to rebuild someone's life. And when you have so many lives that were uh, damaged and destroyed, it really is a catastrophe. More than 200,000 people remain without power in Florida. President Biden met with Governor Ron DeSantis in Florida this week, as well as some of the victims of the hurricane, and pledged to support the state as it recovers. President Joe Biden is also promising $60 million to help Puerto Rico's coastal areas rebuild and prepare for future storms after Hurricane Fiona slammed the island last month. While touring the damage on the island, he met with families impacted by the storm that brought more than two feet of rain, causing catastrophic flooding and mudslides. At least 25 people died in the storm, and some 100,000 are still without power two weeks after the storm made landfall. We came here in person to show that we're with you, Amer all of America is with you, as you receive and recover and rebuild. I'm confident uh, to, uh, I'm confident we're going to be able to do all you want, Governor, and I'm committed to this island. Many Puerto Ricans believe the $60 million isn't enough to restore the island, still struggling to recover after being devastated by Hurricane Maria in 2017. <laughs> Cuban citizens flooded Havana streets in protest, demanding food and electricity after Hurricane Ian left the entire country without power. The storm heightened Cuba's economic crisis with widespread supply shortages and daily blackouts already common. Power returned to the island on Monday, but long lines for food, medicine and supplies remain. The people of South Sudan, they don't produce anything. All of their food is coming from other countries. A country ravaged by war struggles to feed its people. 
As fears of starvation loom, one woman continues her work in a leper colony, helping those banished from society. Next. Leprosy, a disease many think is only found in the Bible. But today, even though it is treatable, thousands still suffer from it, especially in poor communities where medicine is hard to come by. As EWTN correspondent Colin Flynn reports, those living with leprosy are cast out of society, but they find comfort in each other and in the few who are brave enough to help them. These young boys are cleaning the dirt from the door of their hut using their bare hands. These young girls are pumping life-saving water from a well. This man with disabilities is moving around in a homemade wheelchair. What you're watching is rare footage taken inside one of South Sudan's leprosy colonies. Under the sweltering African sun, this community here in the region called Rumbek live in dire poverty, where every day is a battle for survival. They live here with the disease leprosy, as they have been banished from other towns and villages, seen as unclean. These people have been chased several, several times. Many of them have died from being eaten by hyenas. The, the places that they were living here, there was no doors, there was no shelter, so the animals could just come in at night and you see they're attracted to the wounds. This is Nolene Lochran, an Irish volunteer who has devoted herself to helping the 5,000 people who live in this colony many of whom are missing fingers, hands and toes, and other limbs. This is Mary. Mary, uh, as you can see, has had leprosy. Uh, they had to cut her hands off. Uh, she's got four children, and this is her little house here. Now, believe it or not, this house is actually uh, very good in standards of the people that live, that live here. She has a bed, a, a homemade bed. It's not a bed as we know a bed, but it's still very good and very reasonable. Most people wouldn't have anything here. Outsiders rarely get to see what life is like in a colony like this, but Nolene has granted us access. Leprosy is something that you never hear about anymore. No. Whenever I think of leprosy, I think of the biblical references. Yes. But here in South Sudan, there still are huge patches of the community in certain there's, areas. There's huge amounts of leprosy here in South Sudan. But leprosy is caused, caused by a combination of different things. One of them is hygiene. And a, if you have no system of hygiene, which there is absolutely no system here. I mean, in this particular area, area there's about 4,900 people and there's one toilet. They live here, Nolene, because they're not allowed to live in the city of no, Rumbek, in no. the town, or kind of some of the, the more built up yeah. villages. They have to have their own colony here. All down through uh, history, uh, lep lepers have been chased away because of the particular kind of disease that it is. It's contagious and also it carries a terrible smell from the rotten flesh. It sounds horrific, but it's the reality. If the people here do not get their medication, their leprosy would get worse. Their skin rots and they become weaker and weaker. Nolene supplies the people with food and medication, collecting what she can from donors to pass on to the community. 10 kgs of beans, 20 kgs of posho, they get oil, uh, soap, sugar, tea and salt. And how long should that keep them going for? That will only keep them going for two weeks and, and that, that's stretching it because most of these families have uh, approximately six to seven children. So you're talking that you're really only giving them one meal a day. With the help of charities like the Sudan Relief Fund, the community here is able to survive. And even though they have nothing, they are filled with such joy and gratitude for the little help they do get.
Growing up in Ireland, Nolene always dreamed about going to Africa to work with the poor. South Sudan is known all over the world because of the war, because of the unrest, because of the violence. Why did you want to come to a country like South Sudan? Because it was the worst. I felt that I wanted to reach the really people who were, were in the worst position possible. And I believed that I, if, if nothing else, that my love and my heart for them could help them. And even today as we're doing this interview, we have our friends here from the National Police Service, the army who are protecting us. So even today, there still is the constant threat of danger. Yes. It's, it's in the air. It's constant here, it never leaves. It's a frightening place to live, but a wonderful place to live. The people here know that Nolene is putting herself at great risk just being in South Sudan, a place where most will not come. And because of that, and the kindness and affection she shows towards them, they greatly respect and admire her. Yeah, that you are the gift from God. One little boy who has captured Nolene's heart is Tarkoch. He came here with his mother when they were chased away from the last place they lived. And do you say your prayers? Yeah. What about this one? Tarkoch has leprosy on his face and he's also had a stroke. Hey, Tarkash, what do you call Nolene? Auntie Nolene. The people here have been told they're not welcome anywhere outside their community, except by one group, the Catholic Church. Every Sunday, they are welcomed in a church which is outside the community. The gospel message that everyone is equal in the eyes of God, regardless of how strong or weak you are, rich or poor, healthy or sick, is something Nolene tells them again and again. Do you know how many times our Lord mentions you in the Bible? I said, do you know how special you were to him? And by, you know, talking to them about things like that, it, is, it lifted their confidence and their morale and is proving to them that they're worth more. Nolene, what does the future hold for you? Will you ever go back home or is Africa now home? My heart belongs with the poor and whatever time I've got left, I'd like to continue giving myself to the people of God. As you've just seen, the conditions for the people living here in this colony are incredibly tough. And with a looming famine, they could be about to get even worse. But for Nolene, she continues to do her work, dedicated to trying to alleviate the pain and the suffering of the people she meets in any way that she can. In Rumbek, South Sudan, Colum Flynn for EWTN News In Depth. There's more to this story that we unfortunately do not have time for on our program, but follow us on Facebook or head over to the EWTN YouTube page to see more of Colum's story. And finally today, a must-see event is happening every night until mid-October at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Using the latest technology, a new nine-minute film about the life of St. Peter, our first pope, is being projected every evening on the basilica's facade. The multimedia program is all part of a spiritual pilgrimage created to explore the history of St. Peter. Take a look in our Images of the Week.
Our church is ever ancient, ever new. That does it for us this week. I'm Monse Alvarado. Tune in next week for our coverage of the 60th anniversary of the Second Vatican Council, the changes it implemented and its impact on parishioners. See you then.